Welcome to episode five of Beef Brothers. This video will be on YouTube and in podcast format on your listening app of choice. Let's say good day to the iconic duo of 1989 NBA champion and 18 year veteran Rick Mahorn and 1982 all rookie first teamer and a two time NBA all star Jeff Ruland. How are we this evening, gentlemen? I'm great, Adam. I'm, I'm great. How about you, Jeff? I'm just peachy. Oh, boy. You look like a peach You've been out in the sun. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. You in the sun and that daggone electric shock you got in your hair. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> your brother. Yeah, okay. <laughs> He's trying to get my color. <laughs> <laughs> Our episodes begin with discussion on today's NBA, and then we'll cover the latest news and hear Rick's and Jeff's opinions, and then I'll turn back the clock as they reminisce about their lives in basketball. Today, we plan to discuss Jeff's and Rick's funniest teammates or opponents, perhaps, and finish with a few listener-submitted questions and comments. As we record this, it's the evening of April the 26th in the USA. There's four Game 5s on the slate tonight. Two of them are in progress as we talk. Just before we discuss the playoffs, there's been a slew of 2023 NBA awards that were recently announced. The Rookie of the Year was Paolo Bancaro of Orlando. Six Man of the Year went to Malcolm Brogdon of Boston. The Defensive Player of the Year was Jaron Jackson Jr. of Memphis. Most Improved Player was Larry Markinen of Utah. Coach of the Year was Mike Brown from Sacramento. And the Clutch Player of the Year, De'Aaron Fox of Sacramento. Now, Rick, if I'm not mistaken, you actually called Paolo's first regular season game at Orlando when you were there with the Pistons. What jumps out to either of you there from that list of award winners? And do you think, uh, for the most part, they got it right? I think they got it right. Paolo was playing pretty well. He's 6'10 and can put the ball on the floor, run the court very well. Very precise and, and plays older than he is. I like the way that he comes and approaches the game with, hey, this is Orlando. Yeah, might be the first pick of the draft, but he really came prepared each night to play. So he didn't really back down. Sometimes you get that rookie lapse, and he probably got it a couple of times, but still, Orlando's got a good player in him, and hopefully they get some pieces so they can win some more games. Hey, Horn, you store him live. I know he's like 6'9". What's he, about 230, 240? Yeah, about 230. Oh, he's strong, right? Yeah, pretty strong around the basket, can post up, can shoot the basketball. But now... He plays a high usage rate because they need his game from all aspects. But like I said, he's got a promising future down there in Orlando. And I think Orlando having that first pick other than having Shaq and Penny Hardaway at the number two pick and also Dwight Howard, this is somebody that can play in multiple positions. What do you think about any of the other results there? I remember earlier in this season, Jeff, you were talking about Larry Markinen. Yeah, I was kind of that up that I was right on about. He's had a great sort of breakout season, I guess, of sorts. Hold on, hold on. Duh. Yes, yeah, yeah, whatever. I agree with all the picks. They were they were spot on. You could go here or there. I had no problem with any of those. I'd like to mention the changing of the guards at the Washington Wizards. I nominate Rick Mahorn or Kevin Greavy as the new basketball president. How about that? Well, I'd be an honorary president. Then that means I got to go back down to D.C. It'd be my pleasure. Sir Jeff. Draft some good play. When you look at it, there's going to be a lot of changes in this league. How it is when coaching carousels, general managers, presidents. We see where Emi Adoka is back in the league with the Houston Rockets. And unfortunately, this is the business that we've been involved with all our lives and seeing what goes on and seeing new ownership up in Minnesota, a litany of things that goes on, and all these awards. I'm really impressed with the people who have votes. I'm really anxious to see who they're going to pick to be the MVP. Adds up all this steam, and you go like this. Mike Brown did a great job with the Sacramento Kings. And like you said, rules earlier, Laurie Markin and played well. And nobody predicted Utah to be the way they were this year in the playoffs and then out of the playoffs. But Injuries caught up with them as well. And then they traded every dog on body. So they got a promising future because Laurie Markin, and don't get me wrong, he left Chicago to go to Cleveland. And right now, Cleveland is getting their butts kicked by the Knicks. But was it an even trade? He lost a lot with marketing. He's 6'11", can shoot the ball. Utah's got a promising future with him as well. I had always liked them, and I just thought he 
another level uh, with the games last summer with the European, I don't know exact tournament name. But they're playing for a spot in the Olympics, and that's what they were doing, and he played well. My thing is a lot of these players get to different teams, Adam, and they get different roles. Like Chauncey Billups, for example, high pick, next thing he's traded here, here. But then he found a home in, in Detroit, won a championship, was the MVP. There's a lot of system players. And, and Jeff, from when we played, you go with Chicago, for example. Chicago had all these players, but then it was all about Michael and Scotty. And it was never about the other players, but other teams saw this and say, oh, okay, we can get this player and he's going to be great for us. And then did he bring Michael and Scotty with him? <laughs> because when they get somewhere else and they pay him all his money, they're just average. They're not even that player. We look at players like Spencer Denwitty, even though Brooklyn didn't advance. You look at him, he was drafted here in Detroit. It was out of the league. And then he was in the G League. And next thing, he gets a chance, an opportunity to play for the Chicago Bulls. And then he gets with the Nets. Then he gets traded to Dallas. But still, it's keeping a job in this league is very hard, but it's able to adapt in your surroundings. Right. No offense with Kyrie, his talent, everything. I just, that was not a good trade. I think they gave up too much. I hope those guys can play together. And I mm -hmm. sure as not have anybody on that team that plays any goddamn defense. So we have roles. And we're all role players in this league. Jeff, when you got to be on the all rookie team offensively, you were you were a little bit more adept than anybody else. Gene Chu figured, oh, we're gonna have to run through our bigs. I was a rebounder. I could score, but I wasn't the primary. And the thing is when teams set up, especially in the playoffs, we're looking at the playoffs now. You look at the Denver Nuggets the other night beating Minnesota, and I'm like, okay, they got a two-headed monster, Murray, but they got one big monster and Joker. You get the role player, look, Michael Porter Jr. hits a couple of threes and go like, well, damn, did this just get real quick and interesting? But that's what you look for. It's like somebody will look at me and say, oh, you can't score. But then I get to Philly, I get a chance, an opportunity to showcase what I can do. So it's all about opportunity and also the, the also, we played together, but if we got the ball more, we could play with anybody. We just didn't have a great bench. Even when we had, we could pick a little bit. And Gene never played the guys enough. My rookie year, we were second in the league in defense. I don't know what the next couple of years, I would have think we, we were right there too. We could see the shit out of anybody. Celtics had Hall of Fame guys coming off the bench. And we had Gibson, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry, Gib. Well, not necessarily him, but the year that we went to the playoffs, it was Frank and, and Greavy and Big and Bills, Greg Ballard, Carlos and Don Collins and Charlie. Yep. And we had John Lucas. We had fun as a team and we all liked each other. There was no agenda. Everybody had one thing and we we're going to win and we won and then we were taken care of accordingly. Yeah. I, <laughs> I had fun coming off the bench. I knew I couldn't foul out in 28 minutes. And look, I got to give a shout out to Spencer Haywood and Jim Jones. Those two old heads kept us focused too. So the maturity. Jim kept us focused. Spencer was. He was just hanging with her. Good. Second year was much. He was a little bit of a distraction. Yeah. One of my idols went up to that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so what else you got there, Adam? Well, it's great there to hear that reminiscing about those bullet teams of the early 80s. And we'll get back to them. A little bit later on, let's just quickly talk about the 2023 playoffs. We've got three teams that have progressed to the conference semis already. Philadelphia swept Brooklyn, Denver disposed of Minnesota, four games to one, and Phoenix eliminated the Clippers, four games to one. So the Nuggets and Suns meet in round two. What are your thoughts on the teams that are already in that second round, the 76ers, Suns, and Nuggets? Well, for me, if it's the Philadelphia 76ers, it depends on Joel and B, his force that he has in there and that and the game, but also you have to give it to Philadelphia because the others are playing well. The Tobias Harris is melting, coming off the bench, making three shots at big times. Also, you got Harden. Can't forget about the the former MVP and Maxi. So they have pieces. It's just how far can they go? And then you got Boston is trying to get there, but they messed up last night. If I'm a coach. Knowing that they got Trey Young, I'm not going to let him put up a three. 
I'd rather let somebody else put up something. And the thing is, you can't be that far back because between him and Steph Curry, they all shoot the ball. That's when my coaching mentality come in and defensive mentality. You don't let no guy just walk up and you jab at him, jab at him. You know what? Mm-mm. If you can go into overtime, you play him off the three-pointer, not outside the three-pointer where he can win. But, hey, got to give it to them. But Philadelphia, in order for them to advance, they play the winner of Boston, right? Yeah. And I'm looking at Boston. I'm saying, okay, can Boston beat Philadelphia? Hmm. That's going to be a doozy because you got both of the cities that don't like each other as far as competition of the city, but it's also a throwback game. I don't know if Milwaukee going to make it. I think they're limping right now and you know, letting Jimmy Butler get 56 and have one of them career-type games. I don't know. Hmm. The Knicks are blowing out Cleveland. I'm going like, huh, I like New York because they're gritty. So I wouldn't be surprised if New York is playing in the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't know if they can advance, but hey, they, everybody's got an opportunity. All the parity is in this league right now. Talking about the Knicks and Cavs game, currently per my NBA app, looks like the Knicks are up by 15 in the third mm-hmm. quarter. And out west, we've got the Lakers who are currently down by 17 to the Grizzlies. That's getting towards half time. So we are on the brink of seeing possibly a seven or eight seed actually eliminating the number one or two seed with Miami, surprisingly, with a 3-1 lead over Milwaukee. And the Lakers, although they're in trouble at the moment, are up 3-1 on the Grizz. Now, I also remember earlier this season, Jeff, if I'm not mistaken, you said as well that the Miami Heat could be a dark horse come playoff time. Yeah, but they've got to have someone step up here and can't expect him to go in Milwaukee and drop another 50. I would think they're going to try to double him a little bit. I look at Milwaukee, and when Giannis went down, Giannis, his usage rate for that team is over 52%. If I'm correct, he rebounds, he he plays defense, he plays every minute hard like it's the last. But his energy, even in the playoffs, people kind of misinterpret things sometimes. You could beat a team all year, but you're not playing that team seven times. That's the big thing. This is a team you're going to see seven times. Milwaukee's got to win the next one. If they don't win the next one, they can't think about playing another two more games. So... Oh, one at a time. One at a time. They're looking like, okay, we're the number one team. Health plays a part. Kawhi Leonard didn't play. Paul George didn't play. Just go down the line. Tyler Hero's not playing right now. People are missing people on each team. And health is always going to be key to go in there. Hmm. Well, with Philadelphia, with the big fella being out, coming back, his conditioning in the last couple of Post seasons have not been the best. I'm worried about does he get back to where he's 100% healthy and then is his conditioning straight? Rose, I look at Embiid and, and say, well, he's averaging 30. But when I saw the way that Philadelphia played without Embiid, it was like you couldn't concentrate. And one thing that defense is concentrating on, remember the first game they kept double teaming him up on the, on the yeah. elbow. But when you had guys like Paul Reed giving you 14 rebounds. You can't center in on who or, or Harden or Maxi or, or Tobias Harris. So who are you centering on if you drop Vaughn or if you Boston? Who are you centering on if you don't have Joel? Well, then you can play him more straight up. You don't have to double. And that's what I'm saying. I think Hawk deserves a bit of hat the way he's conformed to become more of a playmaker. That's off to him. But all depends on the big fella, man, if he's going to be that neat. They might not need him now, but they may need him the next round or something like that. Interesting times ahead. Just in terms of the Lakers-Grizzlies series, I'd like to briefly ask your thoughts on Dylan Brooks. His comments early in the series versus how things are tracking at the moment. Looks like Memphis are holding steady at the moment in Game 5. But what do you make of his on- and off-court performance as this series has progressed, guys? My thing with Dylan Brooks is the last time you said something is when you won. Your antics can get old quickly. And the fact of the matter, you're down 3-1, and it's a possibility that the hardest game is the closeout game. But Lakers are sitting back saying, okay, they got to come in there and fight. Not over, because I've seen teams just turn around and get 12 quick points, go on a 12-0 run. 
But Dylan Brooks, he had on his Elvis glasses in Memphis in their home. So they're, they're playing in desperation mode right now. And look, the rules, that's another thing. They got injuries too. They're two big men. This is like kind of borrowed time. They're number two seed, but they ain't really a number two seed if you don't have all your pieces. Moran ain't, as you can see, he's not the same, even though he's giving it a law with his hand. But when you look at the, the Western Conference, LA, they're healthy. I, I think with Vanderbilt and the pieces that they got in that trade, man, it helps them out a lot if they if they come to play. But it all depends on Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis is the key. He's going to have to be the, the straw to stir the drink and get him going because LeBron could give you like he did, 22 and 20 the last game. But still, it's like, come on. The young fella got to give it to him now. Real quickly, with my take on Brooks, I liked him in college. I, I thought he should have been drafted higher. As a teammate, you're probably loving to death, but there's a fine line of talking shit and backing it up. If you're not you got some shit and you can't back it up, then you look like an idiot. When you don't go to a press conference after you get your ass kicked, that's that's not a good look for me. He takes it a little too far because you got to have make friends with those guys with the stripes. The last time I looked, unless it was a challenge, no plays are ever fucking overturned. You can bitch till the cows come home and do a, a loop. You know, in the guy's ear while your guy's running for a layup, you know, that's too much of that. Back in the day, we played a couple of guys that whined all the time, but you get more with honey than you do with the uh, bitter lemons. My thing is that the physicality, Adam and Jeff, I love the physicality. I'm glad it's not a lot of whistles that look like this guy got hit, that guy. They kind of complain them because they got those calls during the regular season. But now the referees are just, okay, you're going to get bumped. This is the physicality. You're playing that one team seven times. I understand. But when you think he's, there's a shit call, you address it with the guy when there's a fucking free throw or a timeout. You don't do it running back and on defense. That's my point. It's just guys don't get it. They're hurting the team more than helping. Fight's got to go on and say, they're not switching any of the calls. I'm giving up layups. I'm letting teammates down they're focused then right now but look at what's his name Devontae murray he ran up to an official got suspended but lucky they won that game in boston yeah that's interesting because my understanding is he's got a relationship with just about every referee treats them with respect addresses them with respect and this one guy no matter what he's tried to do supposedly he just got a he's got a thing for him like you said you get more with with Sugar than shit, but the fact that I look at, <laughs> I saw John Vanek, and I'm like, that dude, man, he's like the dude Donnie. You know, and, uh, my man was uh, Dick Bravetta. Dick Bravetta was your bogey man, was he? No, my mine was Joey Crawford. Because Joey Crawford, he was the ugliest referee I ever seen in life. He said, "Come here, Ricky. I want you to see this guy." And I look, and as he said, "Isn't that the ugliest guy you ever seen?" I was like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> Joey, just stop." But you know what? The fact of the matter, you treat them with respect, they treat you with respect. I speak to Joey every other week. Crazy dude. <laughs> One other series we haven't touched on yet, and it's a pivotal game five later today. Sacramento and Golden State are tied at two games apiece. Where do you see Ooh. that one going? And obviously today's a, a really important matchup, studying the obvious. You go, Jeff. You comment first. I said all along, man, experience, experience, experience. I don't know how bad Fox is hurt, tip his fingers broken, but the guys won four championships. They know how to get it done. So I think that thing might go seven, but. But the thing is, one team's got to win on the road. And yeah. when you look at it, you say this, they, they got the experience, but not all of them have the experience. It's only five of them that are there that have the experience, but. It's like the teacher and the pupil and the fact that neither team plays defense. So it's like first one to 150 was the game. And Sacramento had that game until Curry calls a timeout. He did the Chris Webber getting the timeout, but it wasn't a timeout. And he didn't have it. So you don't want to make no more mental mistakes. Golden State with this game tonight, this is a, a big game for them to try to get one and try to close it at home. I think this is going seven. Anything further you'd like to discuss about the current playoff race? Go ahead, Joe. Just my hat's off to Butler's performance and then Brooks and Phoenix. That dude, man. 
He's a hell of a player. I'm a big, big fan. Booker. He had, what, 47? I thought you said Rooks or Brooks. This is going to be a fun matchup, too, against the Suns and the Nuggets. Yeah. Nuggets just don't scare nobody to me. It's like, okay, only person they got to me is Joker, but I'm it's going to, this one, go, I think this one should go seven as well. Don't underestimate Murray, man. You got CP3, maybe a little older, but what can you say? He's been playing outstanding. They've been trying to zero in on Kevin Durant, but look, if Murray's going against, against Booker, Man, that's a whoosh. Poker, Anton, and then Gordon with Durant. Yeah. It's going to be a good one. I think go seven once again, as well as anybody, Rick. They got to stay healthy. Neither team has the bench support. Like, no, they really don't have a bench. After you go past their, their top five, it's like, it's a pick em. It was interesting to see Durant, even though he had 31 points, I believe it was, he was commenting on Devin Booker's performance and said it was spiritual, which I found that was a terrific comment in the post-game presser. 25 and a quarter, you're damn right. Hey, listen, that dude, he doesn't stop moving. He's like Curry, but a bigger size Curry that plays on both ends of the court. And him being from up here in Michigan... You go like, well, damn, was he playing that good back in the day? Why didn't he go to U of M or something like that? Long arms, he's athletic as hell, and he's got a stroke, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just delve into a little bit of history to then round things out with a few comments and questions from listeners. Whilst it's almost impossible to top the Beef Brothers in terms of uh, fun and uh, frivolities, who were some of your funniest teammates back in the day that spring to mind? There's only one. The dude does in this podcast with yeah. me, man. The only guy that had a decent sense of humor was Sobers. Ricky Sobers? Carlos was a good... Listen, yeah, listen we, Adam. He's deferring a lot of things. If it wasn't for him, man, I can't even comment on who, who would do the worst to, to each other. And you go like, <laughs> did he just do that? To do with the bus driver with the Jerry call, he used to sit there and... Call him Barry West. We called him so many names, man. This dude, we had so much fun. That's why we're still the best of friends. That it ain't really nobody I know that is funny as Jeff. I mean, I don't play with guys like Sally and John Sally. He was a little comic or whatever he wanted to be. But when it came to cracking jokes and, and laughing and doing crazy pranks, Jeff had to be the best, man. I don't know so well because we both uh, very same cool. kind of sense of humor. More importantly, two things. Number one, we never saw color. And number two, we could laugh at ourselves. If it was a play on the court and Jeff just fucked up, man, I would just look at him, just shake my head. Oh, you can't touch with them little short arms, huh? Couldn't grab everything. <laughs> <laughs> we would get in trouble on the road when we didn't have things to do or we got bored. We were just bad kid we were in atlanta and there was this young man behind the counter and we agreed upon going into the lobby at 1 30 in the morning and start calling each other uh racial names and uh like fight and we'll shit him stuff <laughs> the guy looked at us like we were the crazy we just sit there we're about six six or eight feet apart and just yelling <laughs> obscenities at each other and it was like this dude eyes down there red man that ain't even that gist of it that's just a that's a real small piece then we had then we had our what first and second team all ugly dudes <laughs> oh my gosh and i'm not saying any names i'm leaving that one up. i'll leave that alone but yeah we <laughs> finished the mess with gene all my friends used to call gene shoe the fifth beetle Oh, he did have a good hairdo back in the days. That's that's pretty accurate. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm sitting in the garden. It's the first time back, and my boys are right sit behind me. And they're yelling at Gene, put ruling in. You're the fifth Beatle. And I'm looking at him like, yo, <laughs> you ain't helping me, man. You're not helping all this. <laughs> far. The best thing, too, was the fans, though. This guy, Leon the Barber, up here in Detroit, I got to know him very well. His daughter cuts my hair. His wife was cutting my hair when I got traded up here. But I remember Jeff, he would yell, we'll trade your white guys for our white guys. Oh, yeah. He was funny, man. I can't really tell you about it. Yeah, I'm going to our grave with it. Yeah. 
<laughs> I like what you've shared at least. But that guy in Atlanta, he must have been looking at your size and height and just thought, oh, man, this is going to get out of control pretty quickly. Also, on that road trip, Mr. Jeff Malone, a horn off. And at some point in the night, Jeff was from Macon, so he was out and about. When he got home, the door was off the hinges of the Marriott, and his room had been violated. No, how about locking him in the room with the pennies and the door? They couldn't get out. I didn't remember that. I just... <laughs> you don't remember putting the change in the door, Jeff Brules, right? You push on the door, and you back then, that was the key. I'm done with you. Next, Adam. Adam, leave that one alone. Let's go. All right, let's go. One thing. Do you remember the New York Hotel, the Summit? The Summit or the Lexington? The Summit. We were on the 18th floor, and then was some stuff was going out the windows. We can't tell you. Know, to, to, to. I wasn't there then. Oh, yeah, you were. <laughs> I played the fifth. Next, Adam. <laughs> you were. What was going out the window, Jeff? You don't want to know. Okay, <laughs> we'll move on. Perhaps we'll circle back. We hope the people that are listening don't remember that. Say, oh, I remember something flying. But anyway, <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Adam. Something hit me on the head down on the sidewalk. A few listener questions and comments to round things out. Ken C. from the Beef Brothers YouTube channel asks, what was your relationship like with Hall of Famer Wes Unseld? I know we've probably touched a little bit on Wes's impact on previous episodes my first year jeff was overseas my first year was with west and i tell you man this this cinder block of a man would beat you like you stole something and you're thinking you you can get by him or you can outrun him but he cut the court off he was so smart and he was so intelligent of knowing his limitations but beating you to the spot before you even got there so i learned a lot from him and i got a lot of things that well, my body is probably hurting from him. But I'll tell you, when I got this earring in my ear, Jeff, he said, come here, I'm going to kiss you. I'm sitting there going like, yeah, okay, well, okay, Wes. <laughs> this is where I kind of molded some of my game around him. Love to hear it. I grew up watching him play the Knicks, and I tried to emulate his outlet pass and things like that. And I did not play with him, unfortunately. So I didn't feel comfortable around him. I just didn't. Didn't feel comfortable asking him things that, not that he wouldn't have been helpful, but I, I tell you what, any game when he called a game that, that I played and he was always gracious and very forthcoming about my skills and I always appreciated that about him. I unfortunately didn't get a chance to play with him, so. His last season was 1981. Just missed out on that one with him, Jeff. I think he did commentary with, was it Jim Brinson? West did Jordan's first game, matter of fact. Yeah, sure he did. Optimistic Prime 86 is back. He returns with another question. Constant, I like them. It's starting to grow on me. I hope this is a good question. This is via the Brief Brothers YouTube channel, and it's a comment that I'll turn into a question, particularly for you, Rick. He states, I've liked Rick since I saw him keep bumping and then backing off on Patrick Ewing, making him fall <laughs> and lose the ball when he try and back in on nothing. So I guess he's referring to your classic pull the chair move which yeah. you used for most of your career. So what are the origins of that, Rick? Where did it first come from and who taught it to you? The guy Wes Unsell. I learned that from him. Shoot. Ah. You take little things from your teacher and try to expand them. And Wes taught me how to, he said, Ricky, and now that we can use the bar arm before you had to play defense with just your, your hand extended. The league said you could use your bar arm. I'm like, whoa, okay. Now I got them, I'm pushing on them, and they're pushing on me, and I push them back. They're trying to wedge in and get position, and I just move my arm and just move out of the way, and they will fall. And that was where I learned that from Wes Unsell, pulling the chair. I love it. I love it. I got Jeff with that a lot. Oh, did you? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I would. Jeff, what do you say to that? No, I, I stole it from him, too, but I was surprised to fall for that shit. Come on. You fell. I made you fall. As far as great, because that's the strongest bone in your body. That's yeah, moron. but I made your big ass fall. All right. If you say so. <laughs> Agree to disagree, perhaps. Another commenter, his YouTube name is Ain't No Half Stefan. Say that again. It ain't no what? Ain't No Half Stefan. So I'm not sure if that's a play on words with something, but. It is a play on word. Ain't No Half Stefan. 
There All you right. go. He comments, thank you, Mr. Ruland, for making the Bullets an annual playoff team during your tenure as this, YouTube, I guess, serves as the place where I can only watch my team's playoff games in 2023. So he's referring back to the games that you guys played in the playoffs because the uh, the Wiz are sadly missing from the playoffs these days. So I think he's just enjoying Ooh. the channel in general. I appreciate that. Everything is uh, cycles come around all the time. Hopefully with uh, the new president that they're going to acquire, seeing what goes on in that organization, maybe they'll get a little bit better. Maybe if Tommy Shepard would have hired Jeff Rubin, they wouldn't be that way. Oh, I could tell a really nasty story, but I'm going to take the higher. Save it. Maybe they get lucky with the couple percent they get and they get Victor. Or they get your man, the guard there. Yeah, either one of those guys would go a long way. Mm. Jeff, anything you wanted to add about the playoff battles that you guys had at the Capitol Center? Well, mine, just playing Boston and us getting our name, the people naming us when you find other teams naming you where you get Johnny Most yelling out your name, and that makes you makes you know that you're good enough to stay in this league. So I, I look at it when we used to battle in the playoffs. We just wanted to win. We played hard. We didn't care who it was. We just wanted to make sure that they knew that they're not going to have a cakewalk through the cap center or anytime we're on the court. We played them the first time in the second round and then the subsequent times in the first round, but I know that everybody on that that team in Boston knew after the series that they had been in one with us. And Mm. every game always closed, and they won all the series. You can go back and watch some of the film. You know, those few pivotal calls at the end of the game always seem to go the the leprechaun's way. Recently, some footage has actually surfaced of the end of a Celtics bullet series. Just as the series concluded at Washington, there was a fight that almost broke out just as the buzzer ended I think it was Gerald Henderson and I can't remember who he was going against Frank Johnson Frank Johnson Ooh. yeah what happened was Gerald threw the ball at Frank and then Frank oh, had enough just jumped him and then uh, shit hit the fan it was a little too late we should have done that a little earlier in the game mm. yeah it just popped up recently on YouTube and I think a few Twitter and Instagram feeds I've seen the fracar at the end i thought that could have got out of control but thankfully tempers calmed quite quickly otherwise it could have got quite out of hand they didn't want none of that they they kept it moving (laughs) absolutely so we'd love your interaction with the show if you're watching on youtube please ask a question or add a comment below rick and jeff can respond in future episodes you can also email the show to send it to me in all airness at gmail.com i can collate any submissions for the next episode and you can also reach out via Instagram. Rick is at rickmahorn 44 official Jeff is Ruland Jeff. Just one word, Ruland Jeff. I'd like to get my name back to the rat bastard that stole it. <laughs> Whoever the hell Jeff on Instagram is. Or you should just say the real Jeff Ruland. There you go. That's there true. You go. Thanks very much again today for your time, gents. A pleasure as always, and I look forward to chatting again soon. All right. Thanks, Adam. Love you, Rose. All right, brother. Talk to you soon, Horn. Love you. Thank you again.